uh, we're allowed to go into the school system and, and just teach the Bible and uh, just uh, participate in that. Uh, my wife uh, not only teaches a pastor's wife's class, but she has developed a curriculum for reading and writing. Over 80% of our people, when from our first church at Augie Baptist to um, our church in Quimbu, over 80% of the people could not read or write in any language. And out of necessity to develop leadership, uh, I'd go to an individual and say, hey, would you consider me training you to be uh, a leader in the church? And he said, I don't know how to read. And over and over again, uh, that was the uh, response. And out of necessity, uh, Verda wrote a um, curriculum uh, out, uh, of the pidgin language, and uh, that is being used throughout the mainland and uh, uh, as far as teaching people how to read and write in pidgin, and it's a phonics-based uh, uh, curriculum. And then uh, not, she not only raised our children, but developed a curriculum and taught literacy. Now she's teaching teachers how to teach literacy so that when they leave the Bible school, they can go back to their village and uh, conduct a literacy training uh, uh, class in their church. And the amazing thing that is many people uh, are saved as a result of that. Uh, one of the things that we hear often, and that is missionary, we have heard uh, we got saved because of what uh, you told us and we believed. Now I can read God's word. And it's not just what you said. It's what I read. The confidence, their confidence is now in, in the word of God. And they believe what they have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Based on God's word. And so that's exciting. That's uh, uh, another part of our ministry as well. Uh, we're going to back on September 13. Just pray about it. Uh, pray with us about all the traveling and uh, TSA and all that. Uh, pray with us that we'll get through and go get to our destination. Uh, we live in a, a town called Wow. Now, when you get there, you'll understand why they said Wow. But it's spelled a little bit different, W-A-U, instead of W-O-W. But... Uh, Still the same, uh, Wow is one of those uh, towns, that, or villages rather. It used to be a town, we used to have a bank, we used to have an uh, electric company, we used to have uh, medical facilities, we used to have um, several grocery stores, but now because of the criminal element and uh, corruption, uh, those are no longer accessible in our area. We have to travel to Lay which is a four and a half hour drive to get to Lay. In that trip, uh, that trip is four and a half hours. However, it's only 87 miles. So if you go into the remote place of Alaska, you probably understand that. But uh, a lot of it is four wheel. The, the river where the guys were carrying bags of coffee, that is uh, the uh, that is a road that we have to cross. It's a halfway point. It's up in the Nag area, and we have to, sometimes we have to cross it. Uh, it's just, or sometimes we have to turn around and go back because there's no machinery working it, and so wait for another day. But uh, God is good. We're looking forward to going back and just uh, want to indigenize our uh, uh, the Quinbu Baptist Church with this young man that will be graduating this next year from Bible school, and then uh, continue on with the Bible school, and uh, we, I'd like to start another work as God opens the door for us. And uh, so, uh, Deuteronomy, if you have your Bibles, and chapter number seven, I was, uh, just to give you some time to look at that, um, the uh, grass hut that you saw in the, well, there were several grass huts, but the church building at uh, Bible Baptist Church in Wandumi. Uh, we started in stages. We were meeting outside and then uh, meeting underneath a house, and it moved to uh, somebody gave us a piece of property. We built a grass hut and then built a Sunday school house, and then we built the main building. But while we were meeting in that grass hut, that grass 
roof and then bamboo sides all the way about a meter up, a, a, a yard up, and then open spaces. I was preaching on one Sunday morning and it was uh, the, the, the people were very attentive that morning, unlike any other morning. Their eyes were glued. No one. The children were not making any noise, and, and everybody was just almost deathly silent. I said, man, this is great. And I looked at my wife, and she was sitting like she's sitting now, and, and I looked at my wife, and she pointed with her nose above my head. I looked above my head, and now the grass roof is a snake coming out over my head. I could not see it. Coming over my head, and I looked up, and our eyes met, and he ran away, and as soon as he moved, and as soon as I looked at the snake, the whole congregation just started ah, going crazy and left the building and trying to get the congregation back into the church while they knew there was a snake. It was virtually impossible. I tried to recruit some people and say, hey, why don't you go up there and get that snake out of here so we can meet. They didn't get any volunteers. We started a new ministry, a snake handling ministry, but uh, didn't get any volunteers there either. But we finally caught the snake. It was a 10 foot, about the size of uh, a little bigger than a silver dollar and uh, harmless, but yet it was very frightful at the time. Trying to get the people back in the service was quite an ordeal. Well, if there's one, there's got to be another one. And so they were very uh, cautious as we uh, tried to teach God's word that day. But uh, now anything can happen in Papua New Guinea. We've had dogs come to our services, pigs come to our services. We've had uh, just, uh, and, but praise the Lord, we have had people come and get saved and God has changed their lives. Deuteronomy chapter number 7. Deuteronomy chapter number 7. I want to uh, look at verse number 17. Deuteronomy chapter number 7 and verse number 17. If thou shalt say in thine heart. If thou shalt say in thine heart, these nations are more than I, how can I dispossess them? Thou shalt not be afraid of them, but shall remember what the Lord thy God did unto Pharaoh and unto all of Egypt. Verse 19, the great temptation which I now saw and the signs of the wonders and the mighty hand and the uh, stretched out arm whereby the Lord thy God brought thee out, so shall the Lord thy God do unto all the people of whom... Thou art afraid. Uh, thou art afraid. Drop down to verse 21. Thou shalt not be frightened at them. For the Lord thy God is among you, a mighty God and terrible. Father, this evening help me to communicate your word properly. I pray that it'll be an encouragement, a challenge. I pray that it'll be a help to us as times in our lives we face things that are fearful. And Father, I pray that your will be done. And I, I ask that as we listen to your word, that we wouldn't just listen but that we would become doers of it. I pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Forty years have passed by. Israel, at, one, at 40 years ago, Moses was standing on this mountain and, and instructing the people about God is going to give us this land for us to inhabit. Forty years from this point, it was 12 spies were sent in and 10 came back and said, man, we can't do it. There's giants in the land. And 
Jew came back and says, no, with God, we can do the impossible. We can take the land. You know the story. The Bible says that fear gripped their hearts, and as a result, they did not enter in the promised land. Forty years they wandered. This generation now standing at the very place where their father stood, they are now standing and they remember wandering in the wilderness. They've seen their parents die. They've seen their grandparents die. They've seen uh, God do miraculous things. And, and now Moses is instructing the children of Israel once again to not be afraid. But notice a wording. He says, thou shalt not say where in thine heart. Most decisions are made from our heart. And throughout Deuteronomy, we find in chapter number 8, it guard your heart from being self-reliant. In chapter 9, we read, guard your heart from being self-righteous. In chapter 15, we read these words about guard your heart from being selfish. In chapter 29, guard your heart from sin. But here, we read guard your heart from being afraid. Don't be like your fathers who stood in fear and rejected what God had for them. But move in faith, believing that God will give us this land. There's an interesting study that was done by university and back east. And, and the university did the study, and they had, in their study, they report that there's over 7,000 types of fear. Number one fear is fear of spiders. We have some big spiders in New Guinea. We have bird-eating spiders, and there's uh, spider, banana spiders that are the body is as big as my hand and legs stretch out, and there's all sorts of uh, spiders, poisonous spiders and spiders that are cute and colorful, and, but fear of spiders. Number two, fear of snakes all sorts of poisonous snakes in Papua New Guinea. And uh, we came back from one furlough and a snake uh, laid her eggs in our copy machine. And they hatched and we started up, I didn't know, we started up and out comes this body, this snake coming out, just a baby snake coming out of the copy machine. And then comes another one and uh, just, uh, yeah, there's, uh, the snakes in Papua New Guinea. Uh, but uh, number three, fear of heights and fear of spaces and fear of public speaking. Number 98, it's interesting. It was fear of zombies. I don't know, maybe they watch too many movies or something, but uh, literally a fear that they... Uh, saw in people. In our ministry, many times, God wants us to do some great things, and yet, when we're faced with a choice, we may not verbalize it, but in our hearts, we may say, I can't do that. How can we accomplish that? I don't have that gift thinking that's a spiritual excuse. But because of fear, we limit what God can do in our lives and how God can use us for others. Fear keeps us from doing what God wants us to do. We look at circumstances and situations around us and Fear takes over and we say, I could never do that. But 
But so many times, our fear, whether we realize it or not, will keep the gospel from somebody who desperately needs it and will spend an eternity in hell. Revelation 21.8, it, it's an interesting, you, you know it, and if, but I want to read it and you consider something in this verse, Revelation chapter 21. And verse number 8, but the fearful and the unbelieving and abominables and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is a second death. Many times we'll think of, well, if you don't believe, believing will be the first on the list. But if you notice, but the fearful. Why is that? In talking to our people in Papua New Guinea and people here in America, it is fear that keeps them from coming to know Christ as their personal Savior. Many times they hear God's word and they, they have a, a desire to know more and a desire to be saved, but yet there's a fear that grips their hearts that because they've been told by their religious leader, if you go to that Baptist church, if you accept Christ as your personal Savior, then what you tell me in confessional, I will tell the community. There are those who say, man, if you get baptized and or if you come and accept Christ as your Savior and you attend that Baptist church, we're going to take your baptismal certificate and we're going to tear it up and we won't put it in your casket because when Christ comes back, He won't see it and you won't go to heaven. There are others who are hesitant and fearful in that they could lose their job cast out of their, uh, their village where their protection is, where their uh, uh, protection and provision and their livelihood is. They could be a, what we would, a vagabond, a, a, a loner, an outsider, one without. And so there's all sorts of fears that, or they're told, if you get saved, if you go to that Baptist church and you, you, you follow the Lord, you're going to upset the ancestral spirits and the gardens won't grow. Your children may die or get sick. You'll bring a disease in our village. And so the list goes on. And fear causes them not to make a decision for Christ. I grew up in church. I, my dad was a deacon in Baptist church in Jerome, Idaho. And, and as a child growing up in church, I went to church because dad says, you go or you get a spanking, so I went to church. As a teenager, I never made a profession of faith. And as a teenager, I went because there were girls that I liked and, and I wanted to uh, be friends with them. And so I went to church. It wasn't until, oh, uh, junior year in high school that a revivalist came, uh, uh, Al Lacey, and came and preached a message. And, entitled, The Whores of Hell. Uh, this was one of the verses that was used, that he used. But one of the things that just gripped my heart, it was a fear of, what will people say? 
What will my pastor say? What will my parents say? What will my friends say? When I came forward to accept Christ as my personal Savior, the young man, the man that dealt with me, he says, what do you come for? I said, I need to be saved. He said, oh, no, you're already saved. Don't ever say that. We don't know the heart. And I said, no, I've just been playing. I come to church, but church didn't. If I were to die right now, I'd go to hell. Church is not the answer. Being good is not the answer. Accepting Christ is the answer, and I need to accept him now. It was that time that I accepted Christ, but it was a very fearful moment. What will friends say, people say, parents say? What will they say? And I'm glad that fear did not keep me away and everybody rejoiced in a salvation of a teenager, 17 years old, who grew up in church. But please understand that many times people do not accept Christ because the overwhelming, uh, 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 the overwhelming uh, emotion of fear if you're sitting here this evening and you grew up in church, you, you know the right words and you sing the right songs and uh, you go through the motions. But if you've never accepted Christ as your personal Savior, please, don't let fear keep you from doing what God wants you to do. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He loves you. He cares about you. And he wants you to be with him forever in heaven with him. Don't let fear keep you out of that place. And knowing God. Fear keeps us from, uh, keeps us, causes us to make decisions contrary to God's word. Fear strife, uh, stifles growth and prohibits victory and limits one's quality of life. Fear makes one timid and non-productive. Fear makes one regret and causes disappointment. Fear causes one to miss out on God-given opportunities, seeing that God can do the impossible. Fear paralyzes and imprisons people from fulfilling God's plan for their lives. Fear. King Saul sought a witch out of fear. Fear caused Israel to cower to the Philistines. And then a man of faith, David, comes up. And we see the victory. Jeremiah was reluctant to obey God because he feared the faces of the people. So when we are asked to make a decision... And fear grips our hearts. What do we do? How do we respond? There's two areas that I want to look at just briefly. As we look at Deuteronomy in chapter 7, God through Moses encourages a people in two areas. Verse number 7. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because ye were more in a number than any, any people, for ye were the fewest of the people, but because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out of the mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of the bondman from the hand of the Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God, that keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him, and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. The first thought here is this, that 
when we are confronted with a fear, how do we respond? Knowing that God is there. Knowing that God loves us, that God uh, will uh, keep His promises. When God wants to use you in a ministry and when God pushes you forward and stretches you to go forth to do something that you've never done before, and we say, man, I don't know if I... God says, I'm with you always. God says, I will give you the strength. I'll give you the grace. Remember God's promises. Remember that God is a keeper of the of his word and what he promises he will fulfill in your life. Again, the, 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 the thought is God is faithful, he loves us, and he's a keeper and which keepeth the com- covenant, the mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to the thousand generation. Know that the Lord keeps his covenant that he keeps his promises, and when God puts us in a position where we feel like, I could never do that, God's there. God's strength is available. God's word is there to guide us. The Holy Spirit within us, there to lead us and to show us God's will in our lives. So remember God's promises. There are so many promises, but just remember God's promises. Number two, remember God's promises, but notice in verse number 18. Verse number 17, if thou shalt say in thine heart, these nations are more than I, how can I dispossess them? Thou shalt not be afraid of them, but shalt well remember what the Lord thy God did unto Pharaoh and to all of Egypt. The great temptations which thine eye saw, the signs and the wonders and the mighty hand, and the stretched out arm whereby the Lord thy God brought thee out, so shall the Lord thy God do unto all the people of whom thou art afraid. The second thought here. Not only remember God is a God who keeps his promises, God who keeps his covenant, but also remember what God has already done in our lives. He's reminding the children of Israel, don't say in your heart, don't let fear make you do what your fathers did and reject the promised land, but remember what God did for your fathers and remember what God did for you. As a child going through the wilderness, the miracles that you saw, the hand of God, I think it's very important as parents that we teach our children and rehearse to our children our prayers and how God has answered those prayers. To share with our children the the, the what God is doing and the miracles that are taking place in our lives. They need to know that the God we serve is a God who answers prayer and a God who does miracles and a God who does uh, works in people's lives and changes people's lives. We find that I remember as a child uh, growing up uh, my dad was a dairy farmer and we had acreage of uh, sometimes alfalfa or we have uh, wheat this year the year that I'm talking about he had planted wheat and he didn't have money to buy spray to kill the aphids the wheat is now ready to harvest but the aphids are just overwhelming and killing the wheat he brings us in and he says we need to pray that God will do a miracle. I remember getting in the living room and kneeling down and dad leads off of the prayer and, and just asking God to uh, do a miracle in the wheat and saving the wheat from the aphids. A few days later, less than a week, 
Dad comes running in the house, all excited. Hey, come here, come here, kids, let's uh, see this. I said, Dad, what are you talking about? Look up here on the, at that time we had telephone lines and, and power lines. And he says, watch on the power line, the telephone line. I said, yeah, there's birds up there. What about it? He says, watch them, watch them. And the birds would swallows who came earlier than usual, was swooping down over the field, eating the aphids. That year, we had a bumper crop. The price of wheat was over $4 a bushel, which was tremendous at that time. And God did a miracle. God did something that we could not do with ourselves, and God answered prayer. That has always stuck in my mind of what God has done. There are many other stories about how God has provided through the years, even in our own lives, on the mission field, and how God has protected us and provided for us, and how we have shared that with our children, and over the years, Praying that they would, too, understand and believe and trust that there is a God who loves them, who cares about them, who is a God who, who uh, will fulfill his promises, and that we will remember God. That we will not forsake him. That we will not doubt him. That we would not be fearful, but we would live in faith, knowing that God will take care of us. How do we overcome fear? His promises. Knowing that God loves us. God cares about us. How do we overcome fear? By remembering what he has done. I can go back to Papua New Guinea, even though if you look at the stats, Papua New Guinea is ranked number 10 in the world of the most... Uh, uh, what would you, criminal or uh, dangerous countries per capita. Why can you go back? Why can you live? Why can, how can you uh, go back and live in a country that is so, well, people live in L.A. <laughs> people live in New York and people live in other dangerous places. It's not about the, where you live. It's understanding. When God calls, he's going to protect. And understanding that it's not our, where we're at logistically, but who's with us presently. Remember what God has done. Remember his promises. Remember and so, because I can remember what God has done, and I rehearse that, and I can, okay, God, you want me to go forward? You want me to take on this new ministry? You want me to do this? God, you've looked after me here. You've looked after me here. I'll step out and do what you want me to do. As a teenager, I was very introverted, and still am. And in high school, speech was required. And I just, when it was my turn to give a speech, I skipped class. And finally, my teacher, Mrs. Stevenson, uh, she caught up with me, and she says, Gary, if you don't give a speech, you're not going to graduate. And if you don't graduate, what are you going to do? You can't go to college. I said, well, cows don't mind. <laughs> but she says, I told her my feelings and my fear. And she says, OK, you give a speech. Make it 10 minutes, and I'll pass you. We agreed. and. That 10 minute speech lasted for an hour and 50 minutes seemed like, but actually it was an hour, a minute and 30 seconds. 
when I got done, I said, I'm never going to stand in front of people again. That is not who I am. I did graduate, but it was in a missions conference that God began to work in my life about service, about ministry. <laughs> missionary Jack Baskin, who at that time was a missionary in Korea, preached the missions conference in Jerome, Idaho, by Baptist Church. And I remember how God just began to work in my life. And I said, no, that, I, it's emotion. I, I don't. And I kept putting it off, kept putting it off. And finally I said, okay, Lord, I'll, I'll surrender. But I'm not going to tell anybody about it. And God began to work in my life. I went and told my pastor. My pastor's response was, Gary, you'll never make it. You'll never make it. I went home and said, yes. And it was just an emotional experience that I was going through, and it's all right. However, that did not go away. God kept on working in my life about ministry. And I tried to explain to God that there's other people who are more qualified than I am. But yet... It was me he wanted. He said, Lord, you must be desperate. But who I am, and I will give my life to you for whatever. Now, went to Bible college, met my wife, 40 years of marriage, 30 years in Papua New Guinea. The church has started. It's exciting to be able to go to a place where you just start teaching the Bible and get a group of people together and see somebody saved and give them, uh, baptize them and a nucleus is formed and a church is formed and seeing them grow from 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 100, 200 and indigenize that and move on and seeing God do it again. And I stand back over 30 years I say, that's God. That's God. God wants to use you. I am so glad that even though I'm fearful even tonight to stand before you, that God would take a farm boy, change him, as a tool in the hands of an individual being used to serve God in a country I didn't even know existed until 1991. And how God has done something great. God wants to use all of us God wants to use you in witnessing and in giving and, and in ministering. And, and yet, there's just something about doing something that we're not comfortable with that we hesitate, we procrastinate. And we even look at somebody else and say, they would be better at that. God wants to do something great in our lives. Just as he wanted to do something great in the lives of the children of Israel, their fathers had said, no, we can't do that because of fear. And now we come, chapter 7, and they're reminded, if thou shalt say in thine heart. You may have not expressed it verbally, 
but you're procrastinating because inwardly there's a fear. We read the news, we hear all sorts of things, what's going to come up in the near future, in the future of, uh, of economics, and sometimes we allow those fears to keep us from expanding and giving and doing what God wants us to do. Tonight, just simply, don't say in your heart, don't be fearful. Step out in faith, trusting God, believing I can do all things through Christ. Don't say in your heart. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed as pastor comes. Father, help us to go forward in faith, not allowing fear to keep us where we're at today. In Jesus' name I pray. As we stand to our feet with our heads bowed as Pastor comes. Thank you. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, let me ask you a couple of questions here this evening. Number one, is there anyone here that say, Pastor, please, I am not certain, I am not certain that heaven is my home. I don't know what's going to happen to me when I die. Please, Pastor, I want you to pray for me. I don't know what's going to happen to me. Please. I'm not certain if I am saved, if I'm going to heaven, if I'm going to hell. If that's you, would you just raise your hand where I could see it? Anybody here like that? All right, Christian. Fear can completely immobilize you. It could cause you to sit on the sidelines of life all your days. There's so much in the Bible where the Bible tells us over and over, fear not. Well, he gave two great principles so many illustrations even to go with it of what the Bible teaches is two of those things. One, that God does keep his promises, and he does. To trust in him. Boldness is not the absence of fear. Boldness is serving even when the fear is present. And fear, or and another way to handle the fear he dealt with that the Lord stresses over and over throughout the word of God, not just Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 7. Remembering what God did already. Seeing where he worked. God reminding the children of Israel of when I worked. David needed to remember what happened with Goliath. Peter needed, needing to remember when he's walking on that water all that he had seen Christ already do. And no doubt the Lord wants to use all of us. Don't let fear keep you from that. The Lord worked on your heart. We want you to respond this evening. Father, and I pray that you bless this invitation. Work in hearts and lives, Lord. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all get our psalm books and turn to page 377. And if you need to come and pray, you come and pray. 377.